Ladies and gents, uh, Simon Brown here doing this evening's presentation. Yep, there we go. Audio is working. Uh, everything ETFs and tax free. It's our first power hour of the year. And as always, if you've got questions, you can drop them in the Q&A box. Uh, I'll take those. I've got time at the end. I'll get to them at the end of the presentation. I'm not going to be able to manage presenting and grabbing them uh, at the beginning. And I'm seeing people confirming that they can hear me. Uh, and I suppose the key point, turn my do front. It's hello 2022. We're still doing this virtual. We still don't know who is or isn't wearing pants. Hopefully, I said in my last presentation of last year that hopefully we will get to some live in person uh, sometime during 2022. Looks like that might happen. Not just yet, but maybe, I don't know, towards the back end of the year. We can all get to the JSC in Job in, in Santon or perhaps in Cape Town and actually uh, see some people, wear some pants, you know, make it real. But let's get on to what this evening's presentation is. And we're going to start off talking around exchange traded funds, what they are, and then we'll delve into some of the, the highlights from last year, then into tax free, some questions, and then what to buy or what not to buy in an exchange traded fund. The key point is it's about shares, indices, and then ETS. So what are shares? Well, those are the businesses that we know and in many cases are, are using their products for. And in some cases, Kalula, which was Kome, and they go bankrupt. There's a risk there, make no mistake about it. But there's also massive upside. You know, we talk all the time around Capitec, you know, listed at two rand, uh, now at 2,000 rand stock in a 20 year period. Key point is they're trading on the exchange. In this case, it's on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the JSC. The JSC enables ease of transaction. It gives you regulation. It gives you standardization. So you know what you buy. Pays dividends, your share of profits, DSTV, MTN. They make huge profits. And they take some of that profit and they give it back to the owners of the business. That's me and you, the shareholders. Anyone can buy them. You've got to buy them, though, via a stockbroker or financial services provider. You can't just sort of go stand in the corner of you know, one of the robots at Grayston uh, or Claremont and, and, and sort of you know, tap on windows and say, hey, you've got some MTN to sell me. You've got to buy them via that stockbroker or that financial service provider. They're also regulated by the FSCA and the JSC, so it gives us protection. And let's be clear, it doesn't give us protection from companies committing fraud at points. We've got Steinhoff, we've got Tongart most recently, uh, going bankrupt. It's one of the things we saw a fair bit of happening during the, the, the pandemic where, where some companies just frankly couldn't manage it and they, they just went out of business. I mean, that's just how it was. Um, I'm seeing questions. Folks wanting the PowerPoint, I'm going to have that and the video will be at just one lap. Uh, let's say by late this evening, it will be up and online. So how does an index work? We've got those shares and we'll have gold and, and, and platinum group metals shares. We'll have health companies like hospitals and, and, and drug manufacturers. We'll have retailers, the shop rights and the like, banks and insurers. And all of those are the individual stocks that are trading on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, on the JSC. We can buy and sell them if we think they're a good investment. They then get stuck into what we call an index. And an index is essentially a kind of basket of shares. So we would have a mining index, an industrial and a financial index. And those are taking the, the, the stocks within that sector and bunching them together into what we call an index. And then on that, we can then issue an exchange traded fund. An exchange traded fund is just a basket of shares with a common theme. That theme could be mining, it could be industrials, it could be financials. We could take it a step higher and the top 40, the miners, and mining, miners industrials and financials, all then end up in the top 40 index as well. So one company, for example, let's take Sabanya Stillwater. Platinum miner got some gold interests, disclaimer, I hold it. Uh, so it sits up there in PGMs and gold. It also sits in the mining index. It also sits in the top 40 index. So if you were to buy the mining index ETF, you would then have exposure to gold miners, coal miners, platinum miners and the like. But if you bought the top 40 ETF, you've got 40 shares in that basket and you're going to have mining stocks, you're going to have industrials, you're going to have financials, you're going to have property stocks and the whole bunch. And that's what an ETF does. It gives you a basket of shares. Nice, simple and also diverse. Diverse across multiple different companies, industries, sectors, geographies, even currencies. Uh, in the health space, we've got obviously the big three locally, uh, Mediclinic, uh, Netcare, Life Healthcare. But they also have, some of them have interests beyond the borders of South Africa. So we get that exposure at the same time. 
So those indices are the baskets, and they represent essentially an average. If I tell you that today our market was up, and in fact it was down, if I tell you it was down half a percent, the average move of the shares within that basket were down half a percent. Some went up, the miners. Some went down by more than half a percent. It's that average move. And what you get is a representation of this. This is an index. It's going back uh, to, what, five years of, of, of data there. And this shows you the index as it moves over time and as it's going up and down. And if you hold the ETF, that will be your movement that you will see over the time. That ETF, Exchange Traded Fund, just replicates that index. It simply goes and says, cool, top 40 index, nice. Let's buy the 40 shares that exist in the top 40 index. Let's put them in a basket, and now we can sell it to an investor such as me and you. And it perfectly replicates. The yellow line is that ETF. And you can see it moves. I mean, sometimes there's a little bit of variance, but pretty much it moves perfectly in sync with the index. Obviously, those companies within the index are also making profit. They're paying dividends, your share of the profits. The ETF takes those, those dividends it receives, earns some interest on it, and then once a quarter, in some cases, once every six months, it pays those dividends plus any interest accrued, less their expenses, and it pays that to you as a dividend into your hands. Dividends yours to do with as you wish. You could go and uh, take a weekend away. You could reinvest it back into the same ETF, a different ETF, shares, whatever the case may be. It is your money. Of course, dividends do have a tax implication, 20% what we call a dividend withholding tax. So if the ETF says we're going to pay you a one rand dividend, well, you get 80 cents and 20 cents goes directly to SARS as tax. So let's look at ETPs in 2021. And here I'm talking about ETPs, which are the ETFs I've just been mentioning, and then the ETNs, which is the, 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 the other category. The key difference between an ETF and an ETN is that the ETF literally holds the shares. The ETN might not. They might use some derivative structure to replicate the move. Why would they do that? Well, take, for example, an oil ETN. Uh, oil degrades, and you've got to have tankers stored somewhere, etc. It's just not practical to practically hold that oil, so they make an ETN and they use derivative products. Here are returns for JC listed ETFs during 2021, and it was a banner year. Although, if you note, these are all offshore. And that's the beauty of it. Well, Citrix Rafi is a local, so that tracks the top 40. Rafi's Research Affiliate Fundamental Indexation. So it takes the top 40 and tweaks it a little bit using some fundamental data in that sense. But other than that one, they are at Corsair's SA Property comes in just down there. The rest are all offshore ETFs. And that's part of the beauty of ETFs is that you can get offshore exposure, nice and simple, via buying an ETF. Let's take that one invest S&P 500 IT ETF. Now that takes the S&P 500 and strips out the IT stocks within that index. So the S&P 500, 500 biggest companies in America, takes the IT stocks, which is about 72 of them, and puts them into a basket for you. Now you can then go and buy that ETF in rands. The issuer, in this case One Invest, takes your rands, converts it into dollars, and buys you those 72 different shares. So you've got the benefit of owning the 72 shares. You've also got the benefit of having a dollar investment. So if the RAND weakens, well, the value goes up. If the RAND strengthens, today the RAND's at 14.97. The RAND is strengthening. It takes some of the shine off it. If you want more on that, if you go to justfunlap.com slash ETFs, you'll find we've done reviews on all of them. We dig into them. We tell you the differences. You'll also note down here where we've got the two S&P 500s, one from Signia, one from Core Shares, and they did a slightly different return, 0.7 of a percent. And that's going to happen. And that's gonna, there's some technicalities in there. It might be in terms of the expenses. The Core Shares is a little more expensive in terms of the management fee than Signia, and some nuances around closing prices as well. But broadly, last year, an absolute banner year for investors. Well, one of the best that we've seen yeah, I'm trying to think back to when. I mean, maybe as far back as 2006 was perhaps, or you know, way back then. It's been a long time since we've had such a strong year. Locally, uh, our top indices, the top 40, the Resi, the Indy, the Finney, uh, the Midcap, they were all doing around the 
22 to 26%. Great returns, but not enough to get onto this particular list. We also saw a fair surge in the value of ETFs. The first ETF in South Africa listed in December 2000 by Satrix, and it was the Satrix Top 40, the 40 largest stocks in issue, and that was our first one. So it's now 21 years and some change old. What we're looking at here from 2008 is the value of all of those ETFs in millions. So back in 2008, it was 15.8 billion, and we've now grown up to, in last year, sitting on 136 billion rand. That is the value of all the ETFs and ETNs listed on our market. And it was, a, as I said, a good year, and we picked up 25 billion last year. Part of that was obviously the value just increasing, but also new issues coming to market and uh, new, new ETFs being done. If we look at the distinction, we saw eight new ETFs being listed, and we saw 23 new ETNs. There's been a massive growth in the number of ETNs that are, are, are listed out there, uh, to the point that we're now actually sitting where there's almost more ETNs than there are ETFs. We've got 168 in total. Of those, 86 are ETFs, and of those 86, most, not all, can go into a tax-free account. A lot of those new issues came from uh, FNB in the ETN space, and they've been issuing some really interesting-looking uh, ETNs that cover a lot of the tech stocks, your Apples, your Facebooks, your Microsofts, some of the banks, uh, uh, Berkshire Hathaway is in there, uh, McDonald's is in there as well. They've got a clean energy, they've got a water uh, ETN as well. Importantly, is an ETN cannot go into a tax-free account. So they're great for your discretionary portfolio, but you can't put them into a tax-free account. You've got to use those with the money beyond your tax-free investing. Has a list showing you at the end of last year who were the biggest issuers. Satrix is top, uh, Signia comes second, and Absa is third. And then we've got a couple of uh, sort of big gap between number three and four, and all the way down to Cloud Atlas right at the bottom uh, in 11th place. We've got 11 issuers. Two things have and will be happening. Ashburton's ETFs have been taken over by FNB. So number seven and eight will now be combined together for future and gives them about 10 billion, which puts them into fourth place. And ABSA is selling their ETF market, their ETF business to uh, uh, Satrix, but more on that in a moment. New ETFs that came out uh, issued last year, we had an offshore healthcare ETF from Signia. That there, the SYGH, those are the codes that are affiliated with them. We've got an India ETF that's currently in IPO listing next week, although actually I think that, e that IPO closed on Tuesday, but it'll be listing on the exchange next week. Uh, 24th is list date, so that is Thursday next week. And what that does is instead of investing into the US, as you were touching on a moment ago, is you can get into different regions and markets. So this gives you exposure to the Indian stock exchange. We've also got some that give you exposure to Europe, to Japan, to the UK, uh, for example, to the USA, of course. We've got global ones. We've got the total world, which came out from core shares, 9,000 of the largest stocks in the world, and those are all in one ETF. We also had an infrastructure ETF from Satrix. Infrastructure is an interesting play. It's partly it's renewable energy, but it's a lot more than just renewable energy. One of the responses to the pandemic has been spending on infrastructure. Uh, we saw you know, the U.S. pass an infrastructure bill, one of the biggest bills ever passed. At what about a, you know, a couple of? Uh, we're talking trillions of dollars in South Africa. We're talking infrastructure spend. We had a diversity ETF issued by Satrix as well, which looks at companies that practice diversity rather than just saying, "Yeah, we care about everyone." Companies that actually practice their diversity. We had an African government bond index from Cloud Atlas, which gives you exposure to dollar and euro denominated bonds issued by African sovereigns, uh, which you can then get in, a, in, a, in, an e in an ETF. So we've had a couple of new interesting ones come through. The changes, as I said, uh, just last week, FNB took over the Ashburton ETFs. There are five of them. The only change there is a name change. Nothing else changes. So it used to be Ash MID, was for the mid cap, for example, now it's FNB, MID. So if you owned it and you look at, at, your, at your broker and you think, what the heck is this? I don't remember buying this. 
or it's because you bought it under a different name. Nothing else changes. And then later this year, probably towards the end of next quarter, right mid-year, Citrix is buying the ABSA equity ETFs. Now, that's a big deal that's actually happening at the, the corporate level between ABSA and, 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 and Sunlum. Um, but the uh, uh, net result, because Citrix is owned by Sunlum, is Citrix will end up owning the ABSA equity ETFs. That excludes the commodity ETFs and the ETN market. There's a couple of them that are, are there's some overlap, but both Citrix and ABSA have got the same ETF, so we might see some ETFs merging. There are a couple where they're the same but different. For example, both Citrix and ABSA have got a momentum ETF. Now, what are they going to do with two? Truthfully, they're probably going to merge them. Now, my view is quite simple. I think the ABSA momentum is a way better ETF than the Citrix in terms of methodology, but we'll see what will happen. If there are fundamental, if there are changes to the to the methodology of how they're creating that ETF, they have to do what they call ballot the users. In other words, you will be allowed to vote on the process. And if the majority vote no, well then nothing happens and it remains as is. If Citrix shuts down an ETF, then they will pay you out the fair value of it. And if they just if they merge them and they're exactly the same then there's no issue there whatsoever. As I said, that will be happening around mid-year. We'll get new information, and we'll talk about it a bunch on Just One Lab as it starts to happen. So let's dive into tax-free and the details around tax-free investing. It was introduced in the 2015 budget by then Finance Minister. Anyone? 2015? We've had so many Finance Ministers. It was in Klanklanene who... December that year then got fired. He wasn't a finance minister for very long. Um, and it comes with some limits. 30,000 a year, 500,000 lifetime. That 30,000 a year limit has been increased in 2016 and again in 2020. So you can deposit 36,000 Rand per individual per tax year into your tax free account. Very important that tax year runs from 1st of March to 28 or in some years. 29 February. It is not calendar year. So 1st of March now, which is uh, two weeks away, the, 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 the tax-free resets. And what I mean by reset is that you can now deposit another 36,000 Rand. In. If you've been going the full amount for the full period, you've put 234,000 in come 1st of March, assuming you deposit 1st of March. Right now, you've put 198,000 up to this point has been deposited into your tax-free account. Do not exceed the 36,000 Rand. If you do, SARS penalizes you 40% of anything above 36,000 Rand. So if you put in 40,000, that extra four grand you put in, SARS says you've put in 4,000 too much, we want a 40% penalty, that is 1,600 Rand. So it's been going quite well. We've had, as I said, moving into our eighth year. Will the new finance minister make changes uh, to the uh, 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 36,000 Rand limit? I suspect not. I think he's going to leave it. I think we will probably only see it in 23 or 24 budget, and then he will probably move it to 40,000. The 500,000 is moot at this point. We still, a couple of years, what about, uh, and I'm trying to quickly do the math on the fly. We're about seven years away from hitting the 500,000 limit. This is per individual. So a couple, they can each do 36,000. Heck, you've got kids. You can do 36,000 for each parent and 36,000 for each kid, as long as it is in the kid's name. There's a point. If you haven't yet filled up for your uh, tax free for this calendar, for this tax year, and you want to, don't leave it for the last minute. I know far too many horror stories where people dropped money in on the 28th of February, but because banks, I don't know, you'd move money and it takes time, it disappears, it goes somewhere, and it only gets allocated the following year. Well, in March, the following day, but technically that is the following year. Same for your retirement annuity Reg 28 products. If you want to put extra cash in, do it quickly. And in fact, speak to your, check with your provider. Many of them will have a cutoff and say, you got to get the money to us by this date in order for us to allocate in this tax year. And if you leave it too late and it goes into the wrong tax year, you can send all the emails that you want, but no one can do anything about it. It is, yeah, the, the, the money moves slowly. It shouldn't, but it does. So, 
recap, you pay no tax at all. What taxes are you benefiting from? Remember I said earlier that when you received a dividend, you paid 20% dividend tax or no dividend withholding tax within your tax-free account. Nothing. So when, Sal say, when, when the ETF says he has a one rand dividend, instead of you getting 80 cents and 20 cents going to SARS, you get the full one rand. You also don't pay capital gains tax or income tax. If you are buying and selling, you buy an a ETF for share, whatever, you buy it in the investment, you sell it a couple of years later, it is liable for capital gains tax. Quick, some nuances on CGT. Uh, your first 40,000 Rand of capital gain every year is excluded. Anything above the 40,000, 40% of it is taken and added to your income and taxed at your, ta at, your, at your marginal tax rate. And then some products, such as cash products, which pay interest, uh, REITs, which are property, they pay income in essence, uh, and therefore you just pay income tax. Importantly, Within this, there is no tax paid whatsoever. If you've just got, if you're earning interest, you're paying no interest on it. The only tax you're going to pay is the state, the state duty. When you die, you pay tax on it. And when you take the money out, it's tax free. So let's say you put your 500,000 in, it grows nice and fast and it becomes whatever, 7 million, and I'll show you an example of that in a moment. And you take that 7 million out because you want to have a giant holiday, you don't pay tax on the 7 million. It is tax free. What's important, is of course it is post-tax money. In other words, you've received your salary, you pay tax, then you put it into your tax-free account. With your Reg 28 product, it's the other way around. You, you can deduct what you pay into your Reg 28 with limits, 27.5% of your, of your income, or 350,000, whichever is smaller. You deduct that from, your, from your, your income, but when you receive it in retirement, then it is taxable. What is important is we can't claim back the tax paid in other countries. We have a DTA, double tax agreement, with most countries. So dividend tax is, is, is a, a not paid in the country. But there is some slippage there, and there is some dividend tax we are paying. So if you hold an offshore ETF and you pay some dividend tax, you can't claim it back. Truthfully, the IRS or whichever jurisdiction, they don't know, they don't care about our tax-free accounts. So it's really quite simple. There is the, the slippage is absolutely tiny. You know, it, it's you're paying uh, uh, the the 15% uh, tax on a dividend, and you should be able to get it back, but you don't. But it's only 15% on a small little dividend. That's maybe only 1%. So it's 0.15%, maybe 0.25% that you've got that slippage going through. But short answer: no tax until you die, and then of course estate duty. And you know what? I'm dead. I've got bigger problems than your state duty. Transfers. Transfers were allowed from 1 March 2018, which means if you've got a tax-free account with one provider, you can move it to another provider. Why would you transfer? Uh, maybe you have found a cheaper provider, cheaper admin, cheaper transaction fees, cheaper annual fees, and you want to get away from the high fee to the cheaper fee. Maybe you don't like the product. Maybe you bought a, a savings tax-free account. In other words, what it really is is it's just cash earning interest. And you're like, man, my interest last year paid 5%, and Simon showed me these ETFs doing 30%. I'm losing out. I want to change. You might have to go to a new provider. Or even product range. Now, some are offering narrower products. Some of the, the tax-free accounts are saying, no, you can only buy our products. You can't buy whatever the market is offering. If you want to transfer, very important, don't just sort of take the money out, open a new account and put it back in. That's a withdrawal, and I'll get to that in a second. If you want to do a transfer, contact the uh, company that you are transferring to, and they will give you some documentation. Contact the company you are transferring from, and they will give you some documentation. And then the transfer happens in the background with no tax impact. And then sometimes a mistake is made and SARS doesn't recognize it as a transfer and you get penalized. And then quite simply, you go back to everyone and say, hey, folks, you did it wrong. Can we please have the documentation? And you go back to SARS and you show them the forms and everything is fine. I do know some transfers that have gone wrong, but they've always been corrected. And I do know some transfers that take weeks, whereas truthfully, they shouldn't take more than a couple of days. But it is perfectly possible to do it. Of course, if you're transferring from a unit trust to an ETF, they're going to want you to move it into cash and then transfer the cash. Withdrawals, you can withdraw the money whenever you want. 
you've put your money in, you've grown it, it's sitting pretty, but now you need some cash, you can withdraw the money from your tax-free whenever you want to. What's important, though, is that this really is designed for the long term because the withdrawal reduces your lifetime limit. And here's what I mean. Your lifetime limit is 500,000 Rand, right? So you deposit 30,000. So now your lifetime limit has dropped to 470,000. It was 500, you deposit 30, you're now at 470,000. Then you take that 30,000 out for whatever reason, but your lifetime limit stays at 470,000. So you can withdraw, but it does impact. This truthfully wants to be the last money that you spend. Now, people will say to me, what do you mean by the last money? When you hit retirement, you're going to have a couple of sources of income, right? You're going to have your Red 28 product, your retirement, your pension, your provident, all of those. And with that, you're going to buy an annuity, a living, a guaranteed, a blend of, and that's going to be a source of income. And of course, it's taxable. The money you take out is taxable. If you buy an annuity, the income from the annuity, that is taxable. You've got a discretionary portfolio. You've bought some shares or ETFs on your own. And you can start taking the dividends or the cash out of that, selling it down and giving off that in retirement. Again, taxable. You've also then got your tax-free account. The point of the tax-free account is the longer you leave it, the more that tax-free benefit accrues. So you really want to not cash this in on the first day of retirement. Cash in your Reg 28 products. See how long that can last you. Leave this as long as possible. Buying and selling within the tax-free account is not a withdrawal. So you bought an ETF, you bought that uh, One Invest uh, RT S&P 500, it's done brilliant, but then you saw Facebook, you saw Netflix, you thought, yo, hang on, things are going pear-shaped here. So you want to sell it and you want to go and buy a mining ETF. You can do that perfectly, 100%. It's within the tax-free account. It's not considered a withdrawal. In fact, you can buy and sell as often as you want. So you put your 36,000 in and it grows to 45,000. You're like, well, I've exceeded my limit. No, no, the limit is only on the deposit. Obviously, it's meant to grow. So you can transact within that, ET, that, that tax-free account as often as you want. Just don't take the money out unless it's a proper emergency, like a proper, proper emergency. So here are some numbers in terms of the benefit of tax-free and how we went from it. The first is, if a child was born tomorrow and you put 36,000 rand into a tax-free account for that child, and you absolutely can, the FICA will have to be done by the guardian or the parents, but you can do it for that child. You put 36,000, which is the current annual limit, and you buy an ETF, and I'm making the assumption of a 7% real return, 4% drawdown. What do I mean by those two numbers? 7% real return means I've taken the return and removed inflation. So that the money at the end of the term is at, in today's money. And 4% drawdown is the classic theory that that says, well, now you can take out 4% of the money every single year and you will have enough money until you die. And in fact, when you die, you will leave a pile of cash. So you put 36,000 in the day the child was born. The day that child die, day, not does, the day the child retires at age 65, that tax-free account will now give them 100,000 Rand per year in today's money, no tax payable for the rest of their life, increasing at inflation. And when they do finally die at age 95 or 155 or whatever the case may be, they will leave behind a pile of money, a giant pile of money. I know what you're thinking. Yeah, oh, Simon, 100,000 is nice, but it's not actually enough to retire. Fair enough. But here's the thing. We're assuming that all this child did for their retirement was somebody opened them a tax-free account when they were born, put 36000 in, and they never did another thing ever again. That's it. What if on the day the child was born, you put 36000 rand in, and then every birthday you put another 36000 rand in? Now we're starting to get somewhere. Now, at age 65, that child is earning, and now I've got to quickly do some, so I should have put the math on the screen. Uh, let me quickly do the math. It's approximately, do, do, do. now you're getting about 100,000 per month tax-free in today's money. And let's be clear, all you did was 36,000, and I appreciate 36,000. You know, I'm, 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 I'm acting as if you've all got 36,000 sitting under the couch. I appreciate it's a big, it's a big wedge of cash. 
which you put 36,000 in every year until they maxed out the 500,000. Their entire working career, they never saved a single cent. And boom, they get 100,000 a year in retirement from the age of 65. So 100,000 a month. That is huge. And, that, and that's partly the tax. It's also, truthfully, 65 years. Your biggest asset as an investor is time. The more you have, the easier it is. But let's take some more assumptions. So I'm assuming here a 2.5% dividend yield every year. I'm assuming 6% real growth after inflation. I'm assuming you max out your contributions until you hit 500,000. And I'm assuming that you keep it for 40 years. So truthfully, this is for someone starting in their 20s. And then I'm assuming the 4% drawdown rule again, where you take out 4% of the cash. The 4% drawdown rule says, look, if you're going at 6% real plus 2.5% dividend, you're going at 8.5% on average per year. If you take out 4%, it's growing every year. And this is all after inflation. So what are the numbers? Your tax-free account after those 40 years is worth 7.7 .7 million in today's money. The 4% drawdown from that is 310,000 Rand per year in today's money. So note the difference between that and the child who had 65 years as opposed to only 40 years. If you had been paying tax, instead of 7.7 .7 million, you'd have 6.6 .6 million. And because of CGT, you would only be getting 217,000 a year. That is 43% more. Just the benefit of that tax generates you the tax saving because it's tax free generates you 43% more per year every year for the rest of your life now what's important with these numbers is you're not drawing down on the capital the plan here is is that there's two ways we hit retirement one is we hit it with a pot of money and we spend that money and we hope that we die just before the money runs out and that's a dicey maneuver because what happens if you fit and healthy and you live forever what we're assuming here is that as you're aging, the money is actually continuing to grow so that when you die, you actually leave a giant legacy to your heirs. So you could push those numbers higher if you were going to try and time it to, you know, last day of, Earth, of your life, you spend your last hundred bucks. I mean, that's the ideal, but the point is we don't know when we die. But here's the fun part. That 1.1 million difference between the two numbers, that's just because you weren't paying dividend tax. It's huge. Because you didn't pay dividend tax, you got 7.7 .7 rather than 6.6 .6 million. So the tax-free benefit is significant. So some burning questions that I've been asked and that I always get asked around it. Can I open for my kids? Yes, you can. You can open it for your grandkids. You can open it for anyone. A couple of points on opening for your kids. The parents or guardians need to do the FICA for the child. The child can be any age. Stockbrokers can only do it for children over the age of seven. Financial service providers can do it for anyone. So if you go to your, your, your and you said, I want to open for a kid, and they say it has to be seven, so it's the stockbroker. This is a technical issue in the background. I'm not going to go into the details. Move around until you find an FSP who can open for a kid. Also understand is that when the kid turns 18, it is their money, and they can do whatever they want with it. They can save it and invest it, save it and invest it like a dutiful uh, person, or they could, I mean, I remember being 18 and I, I would have done all the wrong stuff with it, but that's between you and your kid or your grandchild or someone. You absolutely can open for your kids. I also get asked a lot, is it worth starting if I'm old? People say, you know what, I'm whatever. I don't know, what's old these days? I'm 105, should I open this tax-free account? Yeah. Because you know what, you're 105 and you might live to be 106 and then you've got a year of tax-free savings. And what happens if you live to be Jimmy Cricket and 125? We don't know how long we're going to live. So, you know, if you've, so the question is, you know, what I did say there, is it worth starting if I'm old? I'm assuming you have some discretionary money. If you do, absolutely, because there's a tax benefit. And maybe only your heirs get it, but that's fine. Take the benefit. You know what? Every year the finance minister stands up and this year will be no different. And the finance minister says lots of things. And the mostly what you notice is that at the end of the speech, your wallet is a little bit thinner. You need a little bit less cash in your wallet. Why? Tax. Taxes go up. There was a small window under Trevor Manuel where they went down, but not really very often. There's a scenario where the finance minister actually puts some money back into your, into your wallet or your purse. Grab it with both hands. 
Can I change the ETFs I hold? Absolutely, you can. You can buy and sell as much as you want. You absolutely can. What's important, and I'm seeing some questions coming through, is can I buy individual shares? No. You cannot buy individual shares, and National Treasury is never going to change that. And here's why. What happens if you've grown your portfolio very nicely to that earlier example of 7.7 .7 million, but it's all Steinhoff? And then Steinhoff goes bust, and your 7.7 .7 million becomes 500,000. Don't get me wrong, 500,000 is nice, but you've completely wiped out your, you know, you just haven't got that diversification. So it's always collective investment schemes. You can use unit trusts, you can put savings accounts in there, but the bottom line is these are ETFs. ETFs are cheap, they're passive, they're simple, they track the market, they do exactly what they say on the sticker. And if you don't like the ETF you have, or if you think it's run too hard and you want to move, you absolutely can change the ETFs. If the provider you have doesn't offer the ETFs you want, you can transfer, but remember the rules around transfer. Can you have more than one tax-free account? Yes. You can have as many as you want. But here's the caveat. Your 36,000 Rand limit per year and 500,000 limit for lifetime is limit for you, not per account. So if you open 10 accounts, you can't put 36,000 Rand in each account. No, 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 no. That, that, that's too easy a loophole. If you've got 10 accounts, you can put 3,600 Rand in each account, and collectively that's 36,000 Rand, and now you have hit your limit. But you can have as many as you want. And I know that that's the way that you can circumvent it, but trust me, SARS will catch you, and they will charge you 40% on anything in excess of those limits. Will the limits increase? I said earlier, I think the 36,000 Rand limit will increase. I don't expect it this year. I expect it either next or the year after, 2023, 2024. Will the 500,000 Rand limit increase? Uh, maybe. It's, it's moot at this point. We are six or seven years away from anyone hitting that 500,000 limit. When we start to get close to it, I think Treasury will have a good hard look see at it. The thing with this is that this product avoids tax. So SARS doesn't want you to put too much in because then they lose on tax. And it's not designed for the rich peeps, for the, you know, the Oppenheimers and the Mercedes and the, the Visas and the like. Eh, yeah, they're not designed for them. It's designed for normal folks for whom 36,000 a year is a lot and uh, you know, 500,000 over a lifetime is a lot too. I do think that in time the 500,000 will increase but now it's moot because we're still years away from anyone hitting that point. Ah, tax-free or retirement annuity? Retirement annuity, provident fund, pension fund, any Reg 28 product. Because remember, I mentioned a moment ago, you deposit money into retirement annuity and you can deduct that from income for your tax year. The cap is 27.5% or 350,000, whichever is smaller. Importantly, what also matters here, is that quite simply, it's in, uh, in, in, for your, your, your income for the tax year, which is March to February, and it includes your company's contribution. So if the company's putting 1000 bucks a month into a retirement product for you, that's 12000 a year, that is into your Reg 28. The question is always, which one should I do first? The answer is both of them. There is... Yeah, when we were doing the fat wallet show, myself and Christian, uh, one of the, 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 the listeners ran the math on whether it was better to do a tax-free or retirement annuity. Max out this one, then max out that one. The answer was quite simple. It actually didn't matter. What mattered was how much time you had and how much money you saved. So my advice is, if you can, max out both. And then discretionary. Here's a trick. If you put more than the maximum amount into retirement annuity, you absolutely can. You just don't get the benefit this year. You can roll it into next year or the year after or into your retirement. That benefit will accrue to you. So let's say you earn enough money that you hit the 350000 that you can put 350000 in, but you put 500000 in. That extra one hundred and fifty, well, you can roll it into next year. And if you only put two hundred in, you can then take the tax benefit. Or you can roll it until you hit retirement, age 65, and you've accrued 150,000 benefit every year between now and retirement. Now, suddenly, you've got all this benefit that you've done, and then you don't pay tax for the first couple of years of retirement. Holding cash? Don't. Ah, there's exceptions. I'll touch on cash in a moment. What about crypto? 
You can't buy crypto in a, in a tax-free account. It's just that simple. Uh, are there pros and cons to crypto? Yes. Am I going to go into it this evening? No. But the short answer is there's no ETF that holds crypto. You cannot put crypto into a tax-free account. So what to buy? So one ETF to rule them all. This is a podcast Christy and I did now going back maybe as much as four years ago. It takes the theory. So an ETF is what we call passive. Okay, what I mean by passive is that it doesn't have a fund manager who says, I want to buy that share or that share because it's going to do better than that one or that one. It just buys all the shares. So it's got the good ones and the bad ones. But what do we know about markets? Over time, they go up. Ah, sometimes they go sideways for a long time. Sometimes they crash, as we saw in the pandemic collapse of March 2020. But over time, and by time, I'm talking many years, decades, markets go up. Trying to predict which is the best part of the market is an active decision. It's a hard decision. And odds are we might get it wrong. My full-time job is engaging markets. Do I get it right all the time? Nah. If I get it right half the time, I think I'm clever. So should we not keep it simple? and just own one ETF. Just buy one global ETF that owns bits of everything. And there's a bunch of those. I mean, here are five of them. There are many others, but here are five. Uh, the F&B EQF, which used to be the Ashburton 1200. It's now just changed its name, and it's owned by F&B. 1200 shares, global, including some emerging market, but no Africa. The global, which came out from core shares uh, last year, I think around March or so it was listed. It's called a total world, covers 9,000 stocks. The GlowDiv, also from core shares. So this is a, a, a dividend aristocrat, and it, again, it is global, and it buys the mature companies. So you're not going to have these new hot flyers. Why? Because to be a company in that ETF, you need to have paid dividends for 25 years. Google hasn't been listed for 25 years. Neither is Facebook, neither is Tesla. So what have you got in there? Well, you've got the Microsofts, the, the Palm Olives, the Colgates, the, the, what we call uh, consumer non-discretionary non consumer. Everyone's brushing their teeth. Man, even during the pandemic when we weren't leaving home, we were brushing our teeth. Yes, you should all be saying yes at this point. So it's kind of, I suppose, a little bit boring. Boring's good. It's a little bit safer. It's not going to crash because you're going to brush our teeth. We've got the Satrix World, which has developed a market. So no emerging market whatsoever, about 1,600 stocks. We've got the Signia 500, which is the 500 biggest U.S. companies. That's the thing with those U.S. companies. Yes, they are listed in America, but let's take Apple, largest company in the world. They're an American company. But where do they sell their product? Everywhere. And I mean, you know, you can buy them in, in Joburg, you can buy them in Cape Town, you can buy them in China, you can buy them everywhere. So they are an American company, but they are a global company. Coca-Cola, same sort of story. So although it might say, look, there's no direct emerging market exposure, there is indirect emerging market exposure. Most definitely there is. The one I'm buying is the global total world. It used to be the Ashburton, which the code has changed. The reason I prefer that over the, the Ashburton was my favorite ETF for many, many years. I prefer the global for a couple of reasons. It's got emerging. It's got more emerging markets than, than we see in the Ashburton. It also covers more shares, and it has a cheaper management fee. So come March, bang, drop my money in. I buy myself some of the global. Uh, I wrote more detail around that. You can see there a new ETF to rule them all. If you just go to justonelap.com, Google new ETF to rule them all, you will find the details there. We've also got a great power hour presentation that Narina Fissa did, you know, now almost, a, in fact, a year and a half ago, almost to the day, proactive passive management. So whereas Christina and I were saying, just buy one ETF and keep it simple. Narina's way smarter than that because she's just way smarter. And she says, hang on, we can get fancy here. So she does a proactive passive management where she is looking at areas which are like, hey, this is a better buy than that. I want more of this and less of that. And you can find the video from that power hour sitting. Just go to justonelap.com, power hour. You're going to have to scroll down a bit to find the 20 March and then look for the, that, that uh, slide, which you will then find, and you'll have the details of it there. There's also a spreadsheet attached where she keeps the whole portfolio in, 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 in sync so she knows what she holds. and She does what she calls the look-through. 
Yeah, so she can see she's got a retirement annuity, she's got discretionary, she's got this and that and all the rest. Well, what's in all of them? What's my balance sheet look like? Where have I got too much exposure or maybe not enough exposure? Cash uh, works for interest. Remember that as an individual, we get a tax rebate on interest earned. If you're under 65 years, your first 23,800 rand of interest is tax-free. If you're over 65, your first 34,500 of interest is tax-free. Any interest earned above that is then added to your income and taxed accordingly. Bang. And this hasn't changed since 2015. Note what also happened in 2015. The tax-free accounts are right. I think government isn't going to change those numbers. They're basically allocating to you're saying, you know what, you've got this, but now you've also got your tax-free account. Use that. If you are needing income, then absolutely. Cash in a, a tax-free account works perfectly. But if you don't need income, now if you're currently at this point saving for retirement, when you do need income, don't put cash. It's just, it, it's boring. It has no growth. It has no benefit. Buy equities. You can move to that risky space. Absolutely, you can. Be a little bit risky. Yeah, live large a little, buy some ETFs. And understand, investing in the stock market is risky because it might go bust. But when you own that basket, so when Steinhoff went bust, December 2017, suddenly the CEO quit, the results were cancelled, stock just collapsed. It had been 90 rand odd, it fell down to under 2 rand. I held Steinhoff on the day, but I didn't hold Steinhoff directly. I held it in an ETF. I held the top 40. Down or fall 70% in one day, my little ETF goes down 2.5%. And that's the benefit of being diverse. No concentration to one single company that might go bust. What about property ETFs? So here's the thing with property. REITs, we call them. Real Estate Investment Trusts. They pay out 75% of distributable earnings, and I'm using jargon here. Anyway, they pay it to you, but it's not a dividend. It's considered income because the REIT doesn't pay tax. So it's income to you, and therefore it's added to your income and taxed accordingly. So if you are big on REITs and you want to have lots of property in your, in your investment portfolio, and this isn't a buy to let flat that you've got or you want to take your house and stick it into it. It's got to be listed property. It's got to be REITs. And there are a couple of them. I've listed them down there. There's a, a, a few of the, 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 the different uh, local and offshore. If you're going to have property, putting it in a tax-free account is most effective if your tax rate is above 20%. Why that? Well, because dividend withholding tax is 20%. If your tax rate's only 15%, well then, hey, don't bother about it. But if your tax rate's above 20%, put your property in your tax free. And just a quick point on property. I showed you earlier when I had the list of the stocks that did well, property did well. Everybody hates listed property. Why? Well, because who's been back to the office? I mean, at least we're going back to shopping centers now. But, you know, this time last year, we weren't going to shopping centers. We weren't going to the office. We weren't going anywhere. Properties had a tough, tough time. But there are a couple of things. Two points I'm going to make. The first is a great presentation that was done for us last year. And you will find it again, just one lap.com slash power hour, you'll find the presentation from October or maybe it was November on local and global listed property. Our local property sector actually peaked two years ahead of the, uh, of the pandemic. It was too expensive, had too much debt and too many B-grade assets. And the shakeout was already happening. And what happened in the pandemic is the shakeout absolutely happened. Prices collapsed. And what did they do? Well, they got rid of B-grade assets. They cut down the debt and they're now trading at discount to the net asset value. The net asset value, the actual value of the buildings, less any debt owed. But no one wants to invest in property. Why? Because everyone says, oh, but look what happened. But here's the thing. Yeah, it happened. But we don't care well, I mean, the past. But it's about the future. I think property is going to be a strong sector in the next five years. Because they've shaken out. Because they've fixed up. Do they still have challenges? You bet you. But they're also doing, I mean, the the the... Uh, uh, the, the, what do they call it? In the, olden, in, in, in the olden days, we call it the industrials, the logistics property. Logistics space is, is booming because we're all ordering stuff on, online and it's got to go through warehouses and stuff like that. 
officers are getting their act together. There's still challenges. There's still, I mean, you dr I drove down Peter Place recently and just in Bryanston, I think at Bryanston, Johannesburg. And it's a depressing road because there are just so many offices for rent, for sale, for, you know, and, and the first thing you note is that, man, like the parking lot is now a weed gone. And no one's like, there's just weeds. No one's driven a car in that parking lot in, well, I was going to say months, might even be years. So there's still challenges there. But don't just say property's doomed. That's not doomed. It's just had a tough time. And some property is going to be mightily valuable come the future. Mining versus tech versus big banks. So a couple of folks emailed ahead of the presentation and were saying, what about this? What about that? What about the other? Let's start at the bottom. Big tech. A lot of big tech is looking a lot expensive. I think Facebook, Meta, is X-growth. I would not be buying Facebook right now. Yeah, not, not even, just, I was going to say, not even for free. Of course, if, if you want to give me Facebook shares, I'll take them. But I think Facebook is X-growth. If you want to know my logic behind it, just one lap, dot com slash JSE direct, and you'll find a podcast I did week before last, maybe two weeks ago, where I go through my thinking of why I think Facebook is X growth. And although it's 43% down off the highs of September, I am not a buyer. I think Netflix, eh, I think uh, there are a lot of stocks out there in the tech space that are potentially X growth or certainly got very stretched valuations. And I would be worried about them. Would I be panicking? No. And if you hold a basket, that, that S&P IT from, from uh, uh, one invest, or you've got a NASDAQ or the full IR from, from Signia or one of those, should you be panicking? No. What you shouldn't be is expecting the great returns that you saw last year. That is not going to be repeated anytime soon. And in fact, so far year to date, the South African banks, the South African miners are beating the NASDAQ and the S&P 500. And this has happened before. When you get a great period of growth, you then get a period of sideways. The U.S. markets went sideways from the dot-com collapse to about 2012. Zero growth in a decade or more. Our market went sideways from 2014 to around 2018, 2019. Five years, went nowhere. That happens sometimes. Do you want to try and be clever and say, well, I think I'm going to get, well, then you can look at this slide. If you're saying, you know what, I've got my stuff, I'm happy. Amazon is going nowhere. Facebook is going nowhere. Apple is going nowhere. You're right in all three points. Hang on to your ETFs. Just don't expect last year's return. The two areas I'm lacking is commodity. Now, commodity prices, PGMs, gold, coal, oil, all of the commodities, have been moving higher this year, but they're still not at, back at the levels they were a year ago. That said, the commodity miners are making huge amounts of profit, and they haven't gone and done big deals that are going to go bankrupt. They haven't done big capex and green fields and brown fields that's going to bankrupt them. They are well positioned. I hold the Satrix Resi ETF for just that reason. I also hold the one, the Satrix Finney, which has got banks in it and some property stocks. Because again, look at that NetBank update from earlier in the week that sent them all lying, flying higher. The Satrix Resi is at all-time highs. And I don't know that we're going to get, you know, a 50% increase. What we're going to get is massive dividends. I mean, BHP Billiton is paying a $1.50 dividend. What's that? 22 Rand a share dividend. The banks, I think we've got some upside, and we're going to see some dividends coming back. Monthly versus lump sum. So the, the limit is 36,000. You can drop 36,000 in on the first day of March. You can do 3,600 Rand a month. No, nope, you can do 3,000 Rand a month. My bad. Over 12 months is 36,000 Rand. You can mix it up however you want. You can say, I've only got 500 Rand a month, and you can do 500 Rand a month. The question you always get asked is, is it better to do monthly or is it better to do lump sum? The math is simple. The math says better to do lump sum because markets rise more than they fall. But if that stresses you, do monthly. That's fine. I've often in the past staggered money into a market because I'm scared of a crash. That sleeping is way more important. Can you trade within it? Yeah, I said already. You can transact as much as you want within your tax-free account. Absolutely, you can. No, no problem with that whatsoever. Thing is, make sure you're a good trader and making money. I mean, there's folks out there who've put in what two hundred thousand, just under two hundred thousand, and they, their tax-free accounts are worth four hundred thousand. 
because they're trading up a storm in there. They're trading the ETFs, but you know they sold the Nasdaq and they bought this one and then they sold that. Sure, I mean, you, you certainly are allowed to. For a quick review, then you'll take some questions. Short answer, everyone should have one. There's no downside to these. Tax man is giving you some money. Ignore the short-term durations. Markets are going to go down and they're going to go up. Now, if you were in the market in the last two years, you saw that crash of, of March 2020, the pandemic collapsed. Markets recovered way quicker than I thought, but they did. This is a long-term investment. Keep it simple. Watch costs. I haven't delved into costs, but broadly, there are three. There's a cost to buy and sell. You want cheap. There's a management fee. We call it a TUR, a total expense ratio. You want cheap. Some platforms charge an annual fee. You want cheap. In some cases, you can get an annual fee that is free. So watch those costs. And fill up your tax free and reg 28 before other investments. In other words, take the tax advantage before you do your discretionary. Your discretionary is when you go and buy Purple or Sabanya or Apple or Facebook or Meta, whatever it's called these days. Take your tax advantage first because the tax advantage is probably going to be better than the return you get on your you know, purples. And I know you're looking, you bought, you bought Sassel at 20 bucks and now it's 300 and you're like, oh, 15 times. Yeah, yeah, but let's be clear. You're a brave and congrats, you've made a fortune, but it's not that easy to do it. You know, you did it once, maybe twice, but are you going to do it every time? The answer is no. Contact details, this video will be at justonelap.com. Uh, let's say by the time you wake up tomorrow morning, uh, there is my tweet accounts, there's my vanity website, my contact details are there. If you want to email me, simon at justonelap.com. Disclaimers, let's take questions. If you've got questions, drop them in the Q&A box. I've got a bunch coming through already. Uh, Haley, yes, video will be up later. Yeah. CPO, I don't think we'll see an increase next week. I think it'll be in a couple of years. Uh, important when comparing two ETFs, tour or performance, growth, and dividend payment. It's a great question, Tabang. So, Tabang, if you're looking at two ETFs, so if they're the same, if they're both a S&P 500 ETF, then what matters is, truthfully, the tour. Because they own the same 500 shares. So, if one's charging you 0.25% and one's charging you 0.5%, Rather take the 0.25 and that extra savings goes into your investment rather than some management company. If they're different, uh, the two is less stressful. If I look at two ETFs and I like this one because I like its constituents, I like what it's built up, I like what it's got in it, etc. And there's another one that has a cheaper two. Well, that doesn't care because I want to own this one because I want the ETF that it actually exists. Uh, Kubis, where am I investing for the new year? So I'll be buying the global um, into my ETF, the new core shares. Uh, the code is literally global. Um, but what I have done in the last, uh, I think it was, when did I, I, think, I can't remember when I added Resi and Banks. For some time last year, maybe mid-year or so, I, actually, I, know, I forget when, but I've added the Satrix Resi and the Satrix Finney. Uh, actually, I think it was maybe late 2020. Yeah, can't remember, but those are the two that I've also added. Uh, Justin, do you pay tax when changing ETS? Nope, no tax whatsoever. As long as it's in a tax-free account, you can change no problem whatsoever. Uh, drop a list of the ETS, Langard will do. Uh, Carl, if you don't mind, recap of the REIT ETF in my tax-free, please. Any advantage? Uh, yeah, so Carl, I mean, the short answer is if you've got REIT ETFs, they are better, and if your ta and, okay, if your marginal tax, if your tax rate is about twenty percent, REITs ETFs are better in your tax-free account than outside of your tax-free account. Short answer. Uh, thoughts on China and India ETFs? I don't buy individual regions, um, just because it's so hard. You know, when the China one came from from uh, Satrix towards the end of 2020, everyone got excited, everyone jumped to it. And then Xi Jinping was like, yeah, yeah, I see you Oaks there in South Africa. And he just started bashing the tech stocks. Now, I think that bashing is, is largely over. I think health is his next area to bash. Uh, that's on my bingo card for this year. But I, 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 you know, my global ETF gets me exposure into China and India, both directly 
and indirectly because, of course, the products that are in that, the companies in that ETF, Apple, Coca-Cola, and others, are selling their products into India and China. So I don't buy regional. And I know calling China and India a region is a little bit things. Uh, rules of transfer costs. So the key rule uh, on transfer is they're probably going to want you to move it into cash. Um, and there shouldn't be any fees at all. And you can absolutely move as often as you want. Just make sure you follow the actual process. Contact the person you're moving to. Contact the provider you're moving from. Fill in the documents and then be prepared to follow up. It was possible to live stream these on YouTube, watching from China, and the stream has not been lacquer. It was, yes, it is possible. Will do. Okay, noted. Live streaming from China. Cool. Never had a, I was going to say I've never had someone watch me from China. That might not be true, but I'm going to say that you are the first, so congrats and welcome. Uh, the video will be available at justfundup.com tomorrow morning, but let's live stream them from YouTube. I actually know how to do it, I think. <laughs> it's easier in Zoom, but we won't go to webinar here, but I, I know how to do it. Uh, can I move from broker A to B? Yes. Uh, no, it does not affect your contribution. Uh, where can we find the global ETF? Uh, it's on core shares, but go to justfundup.com and type in global and you will see a video from last March where we did a whole deep dive on it as well. But all stockbrokers will be able to set it, for, set it to you as well. Uh, C Paul, uh, what do you use to compare ETF overlaps? Top 40 GlowDiv, I just got to uh, switch Divi for GlowDiv. Oh, you mean the overlaps in terms of the stocks that you're holding? Yeah, so it's a, so ETFSA has a list of all the ETFs and those then give you the, fun, the fact sheets which then give you the top 10 holdings. But the top 10 is usually about half. There's no perfect way to really dig deep into it. But also that video from Nurina Fiss has got a great spreadsheet in that. So I'm contributing 276,000 annually towards my pension per, per annum. What, what, how much is limit for retirement annuity? So limit is 350,000 or 27.5% whichever is greater. So if you're earning a million a year before deductions, cost to company, you're spot on what you can. You're a thousand bucks over. If you're earning less, you're putting too much. And if you're earning more, you're putting too little. But if you are putting too much, remember you can roll that benefit into next year's. RS, uh, if early retirement is the goal, thoughts on using the TFSA before hitting 65 and the Provident kicks in? Yeah, so RS, absolutely. So your retirement annuity, Reg 28 product, you can only cash at age 55. There certainly is thought to then use this as sort of the stopgap between, you know, you decide to retire at 40, and so, well, you can't take your Reg 28, but you can then use this, absolutely. And in fact, if you go uh, and uh, search on our website, we actually did a... a, a uh, uh, podcast on that within the fat wallet. Carter, any advantage for buying ETS versus international? So, no. In fact, there's a tax advantage if you buy it offshore because if you take your rands, turn them into dollars, and then buy the S and P 500, you don't pay any tax on the rand move. You only pay tax on the dot on the on the the ETF move. Um, but of course, you can't do that within a tax-free account, but your discretionary money is better actually move the cash offshore. But be careful, you now have assets offshore, you now need a separate will. So if you've got money in Czar and you've got money in us in America, you now need a will for Czar and you need a will for America. Or you have to wait for the one to be wrapped up because the American court wants an original copy of the will. So first they've got to do all of your South African stuff. And then when that estate is wound up, they can go wind up the American estate. Easy route is to have a wool in both. Uh, absolute pleasure. Pamela, uh, if you're not working, can we use ETFs as RAs? Yeah. I, if I'm understanding your, 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 your question correctly, Pamela, I don't know that I am. Uh, maybe drop me a mail with, with more detail. But I, the short answer, I think, is yes. Simon at justoneup.com. Pizza is pension, RA and pension contributions related? Yeah, they're going to be the same. I mean, uh, pension, provident, retirement annuity, they're all Reg 28. Uh, Musa, is 23,000 interest and tax free anyway mean that 36 fixed deposit is a waste of lifetime? Correct. Absolutely correct. Uh, Clement, if you invested in S&P 500, should I invest in the top 40 for diversification or are there better ETFs? 
You know what, the S&P is one of the most diverse indices in the world. The, the, the top 40 as well is if you've got a Reg 28 product, because of the restrictions within Reg 28, you've already got a lot of top 40. So I wouldn't stress it. But I would say, uh, should you invest in the top 40 for diversifications? If you've got a Reg 28, you've already got that diversification. Amaris, uh, do you have a favorite free website for information analysis on companies? Yeah. Uh, so there, it, it, there's not a lot. Did you say free? Ah, yes, you did. There's not a lot that's free. Um, you know, my stockbroker gives me, I, I listen to podcasts. There's mine from MoneyWeb and uh, my JC Direct and Just One Lap for shameless plugs. Um, there's the Bloombergs and the like, but there's not much free, unfortunately. Uh, Twitter's a fair good source as well, but again, there's not a heck, there should be a heck lot more that's free. There isn't. And, and it's a, it's a supply to our industry. There should be a lot more free. Ladies and gents, I've run my time and we are also uh, finished the questions. So I am going to park it there. Uh, we're back 17 March. We have another power hour. I will stream it on YouTube live at the same time for Edward and others. Uh, this video will be online later this evening. Uh, everyone stay safe. Look after yourself. Remember, if you want to do a deposit into a Reg 28 or a tax-free account, your deadline is 28 February, but don't do it on the 28 February. Do it today. Do it tomorrow. Do it Monday. Do it early. Don't leave it for the last minute. Stay safe, look after yourself if you can, look after somebody else as well. Cheers all.